Hi. Um, yeah, got the tissues. I'll probably need them. This is Lynn's story and um, this is a bit different to what you've heard. We were actually uh, not originally... Um, we met, but we weren't originally matched through the uh, Citizen Advocacy Program. <laughs> so it is actually a blessed relationship that came to be sort of a comedy of errors. Well, it wasn't even a comedy at the time. But anyway, one thing led to another, led to another, led to another. And I was already a citizen advocate, so we did break some rules. And the first thing I said to Lynn was I couldn't be her advocate, but things changed. So Lynn has a dream. She'll win cross lotto and be rich. She'll live in a mansion with a large swimming pool. She will typify the idle rich. Nothing to do all day but just enjoy herself. She'll need a chauffeur because one of her passions is going for long drives. On these trips she makes up songs and sings and sings and sings. She may even one day be famous. Her alter egos vary, but at one stage Paris Hilton and Lady Gaga were long-time favourites. That was scary for a while. So she's a bit raunchy and, you know, these ladies were sexy, raunchy and attracting the paparazzi, even if for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> so that was her identity, if you like, at one stage. So when we met, reality for Lynn is that she is not rich. She is on a disability pension. She lives in a small housing commission house in a poor part of a large country town. She is known by most people in the town, however, for all the wrong reasons. The police have been called frequently because she's been loud and abusive. Assault charges are among the list on her file. Lynn has a history of alcohol and drug abuse and with no supports one might imagine that she's actually homeless, picking up butts in the street and stuff. Hygiene is poor, she, she smokes butts that she picks up off the street, has poor dental health, missing teeth, often abused but prides herself that she can give back just as good as she gets. Adding to this, Lynn dresses very poorly but provocatively. Upon meeting her, there will be a, a tirade of verbal abuse, intimidation and put-downs. This extends to those on the street as she cycles around the town as well. This is at the time when we met. Uh, she was attending a, a mental health support group for a meal once a week. They had a meal there, she was there. The group members treated her as the troublemaker and they were hoping that someone else would assist her. A member takes her shopping at the time, but blazing rows in the supermarket are common, and then screeches creepy animal noises, attracting further unhealthy attention. She's tall and strong and lashes out. She never smiles, only scowls, and with missing teeth, it looks a bit scary. Communication is by way of grunting and pointing. Retail workers are nervous, even frightened. When she approaches, there are no friends, no family. She is shunned by all who see her. From my first visit, many things were obvious. So I didn't have the benefit of a CA program telling me about this person. I knew nothing. <laughs> so it was difficult. Apart from the confronting behaviours and lack of social skills, there were constant unreasonable demands a foul mouth, insistent on going out, a uh, conversation must be about her and to her, no taking phone calls in her presence or talking to others. In fact, going to the toilet was not allowed. I wasn't allowed to go to the toilet while I was with her. So no shutting of doors between us. Later on, we eventually solved this problem by going into a disabled toilet together. And Lynn was suspicious that if I went into a toilet cubicle, I might go and not come back. That's what people did, apparently. Even more intriguing were the reasons behind the behaviour. Lynn had been abandoned by adoptive parents at the age of six due to her behavioural problems. She was treated as having an intellectual disability and institutionalised. Poor understanding of the emotional trauma of this led to abuse in an attempt at behaviour management. She was frequently locked in the bathroom in the institution. So at the age of six in an institution... Also, she claimed to have a condition which affected her nerves and as a result was unable to tolerate that sudden loud noises. She wore earplugs but loudness was intolerable and causes her to lash out angrily. And she goes on and on about, you know, doesn't want to be near dogs and I hope they don't get a dog next door and stuff like that. She wouldn't be able to cope. 
in her teen years, her, this is what I've found out since, and, and I had to find it all out, and that was hard, bits and pieces at a time. Uh, and at first she wouldn't tell me anything, so, you know, it took a while. So in her teen years, her adoptive grandmother rescued her from the institution, but she died in her chair while Lynn was making her a cup of tea. She was forbidden by her adoptive family to attend the funeral. Later again, she met a truck driver. They became engaged and lived together. He had an accident and was killed. She then found share accommodation in the southern suburbs where her friends were abusers of drugs and alcohol. She says now that she was in with the wrong crowd. She was always in a lot of trouble with these associations. And in an attempt to break free, she got to the town north of Adelaide um, where she now resides. Emergency accommodation was found for her to get her removed from the caravan park where she had taken up residence but was refusing to pay the bill or leave. So support workers were supplied but it was deemed that two workers must be present at all times because of her behaviour. There came a day when she told them she didn't want them so they stopped coming. No discussion, no other arrangement, too hard. Abandoned yet again, but this time by those who were even paid to be there. Abandonment, rejection, abuse. This has become the repetitive pattern of Lynn's existence. I met her at a self-advocacy mental health group as the speaker on advocacy. We thought it was something that our citizen advocacy team didn't really need to get involved in. I was visiting the town quite frequently because it's where my mother lives, so I said, oh, I'll talk to them about advocacy. So getting to know Lynn was surely going to present a challenge. And so began a fortnightly visit as a community visitor with a view that CASA might consider finding an advocate for her some, at some later day. I stated from the beginning that I would not be her advocate. I would just be a regular visitor and take her for a drive. Well, that came out later. From the first visit, there were demands of food provision, then a drive. Conversations were limited, no talking while eating, then no interruptions during the drive because she might want to sing. I listened. I learned a lot about Lynn's psyche from her made-up songs. Obsession around the weather. It was always not what she wanted. <laughs> Some days the songs were dark and gothic, eerie utterances, even roaring of rolled animals on occasion. Attempts at conversation were met with argumentative tirades. A simple question would be seen as a challenge, a provocation. Light banter was sometimes tolerated, but was always it always had to be about her, what she wanted to say. I could not state my own opinion or give advice or mention my own family members. A demand was made that I phone her at a prescribed time each week. This was actually not about conversation. It was all about someone touching base with her, making the call, doing the right thing. The conversations were very short. It was just the knowledge and relief that I actually rang. And I still do. And it's tonight's the night. <laughs> everything had to be regular, have routine, be reliable. Punctuality was everything. Lynn would convince herself that I was not coming and would phone 10 minutes before the agreed time with a tirade of abuse. I would need to calm her down and assure her that I was only five minutes away. She would work herself into such a state she would be out in the street wailing or screaming, sometimes well before the agreed time of my arrival. I soon learnt to phone as I started out on my 40 minute journey and exaggerate the expected time of arrival by adding on 15 to 20 minutes. So I was telling her for a long time it took an hour to get there, which usually about 40 minutes. Imagine the effect when Lynn felt that I had actually come early to visit. It was just a small thing, but what a great effect it had on her anxiety. She refused to eat inside a cafe, so to enjoy a coffee or a meal meant that I had to find somewhere al fresco or revert to her number one preference, McDonald's drive through <laughs> and eat in the car. Although Lynn would go on and on about having no one in her life, she would avoid people. I spent time each visit mentoring her into allowing people into her life. After all, she had taken a chance with me and it 
took a long time to develop a friendship. Perhaps there were others that deserved that same chance she had given me. There were huge needs in her life. I realised that recognition of the needs against her desires and demands was paramount. I soon identified that any request for support must identify Lynn's mental health issues as the ultimate priority. Her intellectual disability was quite mild. Her vulnerability came about more through her mental state, her trauma and anxiety and stuff. The anger had now subsided considerably since I started visiting. No shouting now and the creepy noises were seen now seen as belonging only in the institution, certainly not in public, as there was now recognition of the effect this had on others and their perception of her. And she started to recognise that. Any support could only be introduced when Lynn was ready to trust and understand what the boundaries were. Even though her needs were meant immense, I felt that if she was impatient to get some services involved, if Lynn was not ready, then the result could be da disastrous. It would be setting her up to fail, basically. Mentoring around her unreasonable expectations brought about phrases such as, it's a two-way street, and with rights comes responsibilities. <laughs> so to manage the impatience and the uh, difficulty in getting action from Disability SA, I tried to instil some hope by explaining that we were going to climb a ladder together. It might take some time to reach the first rung. Sometimes we might go up three steps at a time, but mostly one at a time. And obviously the first steps are always the hardest. Within a few months, I was taking Lynn to the special needs dental service. Her teeth were a major issue and I had to advocate for the appropriate referral when the local health service, which were reluctant to refer her, regular trips to the city were made for this and some excellent assistance are given and only agreed to in the first instance by applying to her vanity. She'll look nicer if she has her teeth done. Uh, this became a team effort to address her dental care. She had an aversion to medical care and believed if you went to the doctors or hospitals, then they were out to kill you. They were out to get you. A huge test of this point lay just around the corner. On one of my visits, Lynn confided that she had a lump. It was still there a few days later. Feeling a little alarmed and knowing that Doctor's appointments are hard to secure in the town. We went straight away to the emergency clinic at the hospital. An urgent procedure was arranged for the following morning. Lynn was required to stay overnight. Sorry. Um, and um, I knew that she wouldn't cope very well. Um, sorry. So... Um, they, um, she had to stay overnight and the staff refused to let me stay in the hospital with her, which I said was necessary uh, for her to stay overnight. I needed to be there. And they refused, so I slept at my mother's, um, who lives nearby, as I knew Lynn would not cope very well. She got very angry when someone used her bathroom, although I had explained to her that it was a shared bathroom and somebody would be using her bathroom. <laughs> But anyway, that's, they waited until 5am to call me, by which time the hospital security had become involved. I took her home and stayed with her the following night. Hospitals just don't cope with people with disability. A couple of days later, I received a phone call to speak with the specialist on my own. I gathered the news was not good. Lynn had a cancerous bath uh, I'm not very good at saying this, Bartholin's gland carcinoma. So it was cancerous anyway, and required further tests and at least another operation at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. Instead of one specialist at the rural hospital where I met with three, so three men were there, three specialists, um, gynaecology and oncology specialists. They were interested um, as to how best to handle the situation around Lynn's mental health issues, but also curious to know more about her as a person. Following a lengthy discussion, referrals were arranged following reassurances that she would receive the best of care from the foremost expert physician in Adelaide to um, assist with such a difficult and rare condition. Over many weeks, there were frequent visits, at least weekly, sometimes more often, to the city hospital. 
Well, then convinced herself she was going to die and wanted to know the location of the morgue at the hospital. I constantly explained to Lynn that doctors take an oath. They have to do everything possible to make you better. And that she now had a large team of people, her own special team, to help her to recovery. The team members would swap around from time to time, but the number one doctor was in charge at all times. She became quite proud that her condition had attracted number one doctor. At a pre-op appointment, Lynn inquired in a challenging tone as to whether there would be a blood transfusion. Her file was taken from the room and came back with third party consent required, written in red across the front. I was constantly in the position of explaining all the information to Lynn, who does not have any literacy skills, and constantly reassured her that the treatment given at all times was directed by number one doctor. In between all these appointments, I constantly made additional inquiries regarding the process of arranging a support worker, going into disability SA over and over and over. After all, Lynn now has cancer. We really need that mental health worker. Every fortnight for about four months, I delivered that line with a thump of my fist on the local disability SA counter. Still nothing. No offer of support for Lynn. Eventually, the social worker and the disability liaison officer at the Royal Adelaide Hospital lent some weight to my constant requests. Linda had some preliminary surgery before the main operation, but I was allowed to stay with her in the hospital each time. The Royal Adelaide had a different attitude to the Gawler one. Uh, the staff often expressed their appreciation that I was there to calm Lynn when needed. I encouraged Lynn with her art to while away a lot of hours over the several days in the hospital after the major operation. Lynn was discharged just prior to Christmas, but I was reassured that home nursing support was in place. Two visits were made and the nursing agency closed for good, and it was Christmas time. And the replacement agency had no referral, so they weren't going to come. I had arranged a couple of visits to the local health centre. That was the best we could do. Uh, within weeks, radiotherapy was to commence. I could arrange transport on some days to the city for Lynn using the local hospital car service, but was unable to find someone to accompany her for appointments. Now, this is where it gets tricky and you just can't write this stuff. You can't make it up. My husband became in urgent need of a quadruple heart bypass scheduled for the following week the same day Lynn's radiotherapy was to commence. <laughs> a social work um, student on placement with the local community centre could do the first three days of taking Lynn uh, down for her radiotherapy treatment. But the treatment was daily for several weeks. A call was made to the senior person with disability services who suggested that actually I would be eligible for respite services to be put in place under these circumstances. So I actually had to apply for respite services due to my husband's condition to get help for Lynn. It's just bizarre, isn't it? A roster was arranged for the first two to three weeks and in the main, this worked quite well, um, although I got a lot of calls in that time of who where they were and they were running late and all that stuff. Lynn was then found a room at the hospital and stayed there the following few weeks. She managed quite well and as a patient with many people caring for her and about her, she was allowed to go down the street to join with a small group of smoking comrades. I lived 10 minutes away when she was in the Royal Adelaide and was able to visit daily. Nursing staff were quite keen to ensure that Lynn was a happy patient and were very pleased to see her uh, to see me and applied with and complied with all my requests. Each time Lynn was hospitalised, I had to ensure that someone assisted with the menu, as it was always assumed that she had literacy skills. She couldn't even order food. Lynn was sent home within a very short time. Disability SA arranged a meeting with a prospective mental health worker. This was uh, the result of the um, Royal Adelaide Hospital interventions. The introductions went quite well, and even though Lynn laid out the usual demands and, and parameters, uh, some parameters were put in place, a day a week, agree commencing the following week, 
and she ended up having the same mental health worker for over three years, which was great. And together, uh, I was in touch with him quite frequently. Together we recognised that she would need a diagnosis to get on the NDIS. I took her to a final appointment with the psychiatrist uh, to receive her diagnosis. And why didn't we recognise it? It was autism. She had autism. This was life-changing. If only those around her over the years had known about autism, her life might have been so different. She was given a minuscule dose of risperidone along with her thyroxine, which she should have been taking. Regular monitoring by the GP followed. I took her to specialist appointments and after 10 years, uh, she's now totally cleared. Following the diagnosis, I wrote to her adoptive parents. They were in their 90s. But her father rang to thank me and to let me know she had a biological sister who'd been looking for her for 46 years. We met with the sister and found that Lynn had been adopted because she was born into a volatile domestic violence household. Her mother was actually trying to protect her, not abandoning her. Lynn is less vulnerable with um, expo exploitation due to the fact that people are around her. She is now forthcoming around medical issues and I liaise closely with her support workers. We received a great NDIS package and I continue to attend meetings for, with her. Um, we still enjoy our fortnightly drives. The singing's now in, interspersed with a lot of happy banter. We laugh good naturedly at each other and ourselves and we often reminisce about our amazing journey. She's just amazing now and um, one of her talents is making life-size do life dolls and she made a replica of Harry Potter who sits in her lounge room <laughs> and she's doing amazingly. Thank you. I'm sorry I've gone over time.